start at. Let's let's get started. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Let's start. Let's start. Okay. So uh, yeah. So I, I'm going to finish um, basically the applications of the, the QSA stuff for policy grading methods, and like I said, present a, a bit of a history. And then after this, a lot of these ideas will be applied. And I mean, this. Uh, Andre, so Andre Benstein, who's, in, who's the last speaker today. Uh, was a student of Nahum Shimkin at, at the Technion, so he's a he's a great RLer <laughs> and uh, and also an optimizer, uh, and he's going to talk about theory and applications uh, and related themes. Um, so so I'm going to you can't you, by the way I suffered for all of you, I suffered like you cannot believe for all of you. I suffered. I I last this week it was ruined because of this lecture, and it's because of the history is so wild in the control area, <laughs> and and I didn't believe the history, and so I was trying to validate it, and uh, you'll see, here it is. And so this is your question, Java. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna answer a few things about the history of policy gradients from my point of view, and I think. Uh, we'll see what Peter says. So here it is, the birth of policy gradient methods in control, a picture from a patent application in France in 1922. <laughs> it's a railway engineer. Okay, so I'm not going to read this to you. But if you look at extremum seeking control, you know that funky diagram I showed you of taking loss functions and putting them through a filter and blah, 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 blah. Um, then every paper starts off the paper with the same sentence. Uh, the origins of extreme seeking control were found in the 1922 paper of LeBlanc. <laughs> and I, I spent the whole weekend trying to see if this is true. And I, I contacted a friend in France to help me dig up the paper or patent application, and everyone just repeated the same, plagiarized everybody else. <laughs> and so I wrote to Ivan uh, Mariels. I found this awesome paper that gave a history. And he had actually a longer essay, which is what's there. And he wrote to me on Sunday evening, and he gave me more details to, to prove to me he really read the paper. And it really was doing exploration to optimize and try to get the, the train to extract maximum power while shooting through uh, the streets of Paris. <laughs> so 1922. <laughs> uh, I guess I guess I guess it's true. Um, and by the way, somebody was saying that this was making them car sick. I'm sorry. I I tried to find a solution and I couldn't find one. So maybe I should say, switching slides. You close your eyes. Switching slides. Um, so I'm going to give a, lot, a bunch of history today. Uh, and again, thank you to Florence Forbes at INRIA in Grenoble and Yvonne Mariels in, uh, in Melbourne for helping me find papers and, and doing the history. Moving the slides. So I'm not gonna, I just, I'm just showing some pictures just to, just, to, just to indicate the obsession with OD, you know, sort of gradient descent ideas and adaptive control. And it really is worth looking at these old papers. And I did, <laughs> in terms of torture myself. I just went back to get a better feel of the point of view back in the 80s. Um, and, you know, you just see, and I'll do it, you know, you just see the derivative of some parameter is gradient of something else based on observables everywhere in adaptive control. You know, it's just uh, everywhere. <laughs> and you get these block diagrams. That's model reference adaptive control. Um, What's funny is that Carl Astron never embraced extreme seeking control, and I don't know why. He mentions that, but he sort of just moves on. Um, and uh, what's really funny is that in another survey, where he talked about adaptive control up to 1960, okay, so he has a survey on adaptive control up to 1960. It was written in 1996. And he, 
he brags about neural networks being promoted um, in the adaptive control literature way back uh, way back when uh, in the 1960s, which I think is pretty pretty funny, especially since in 1996 neural networks were out of style. Um, they only came back to style a little bit later. Is that true? I thought neural networks had hadn't come back yet. No, I think 1992 it was like really big hype. I got back That's again. I remember so it was really okay. hype at the time. There's a huge it hype in the set. Okay, totally. so that's why. We, so he was trying yeah. to reclaim territorial battle here. Um, but uh, and then there's all this stuff on the Apinov techniques, and it's really worth, uh, uh, you know, uh, Danny Liebert's in Illinois lecture notes on adaptive control, focusing on the Apinov techniques, and and Peter Kokodovich, who was at Illinois, this awesome educator, his book reference there is a great history and techniques and stuff. So I'm just saying, and a lot of it is about, you know, model-free uh, methods for tuning parameters based on gradient descent and other things like that. So it's, it's just worth knowing about. Um, then there's policy gradient methods in RL. And I just, I always need an image for new sections. And does anybody know what this is from? Nope, I don't recognize it's, this. It's, it's original contents at Cyclos. It's been a while. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I guess it's 2000, right? And that's, that's actually when NIPS was called NIPS. Um, and uh, so do you all agree with this language that, that actor only is sort of doing gradient descent or something, that's it? And critic only is like you learning, you know, and then they're claiming that actor critic is combining the two because it's hard to get a consensus on definition. So that's that's the reason I highlighted these colors and all of that. Um, okay, now I remember reading this paper. I was really happy that they were saying these things because yeah. it was murky. But I'm gonna I'm gonna adopt this language if nobody, you know, I don't know if if that's what Sutton has done in this book. I I'm not sure. Um, but I want to give you a history from my point of view of, of their paper and, the, and you know, this and this actor critic method. And so the origin in my mind is, and when I teach optical stochastic control, this is what I tell the students, that it started in 1968 uh, with um, 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 a paper, well, I'll give you the reference in a moment, where they, uh, they look at a parameterized family of Markov chains parameterized by parameter theta. Uh, and he doesn't have a C sub theta, but let's let's do that here. Let's suppose that we have a Markov chain XK. There's a well-defined steady state. So I, I'd like to minimize L theta. So for us, we, so there's gonna be a, this is gonna be a parameterized family of policies and we'd like to minimize the average cost over all possible policies. Um, so, um, and so, so yeah, so Condit's and Cyclist site, Williams uh, reinforces the first sort of actor only category, which would be like this. And I, and you know, and, you know, everyone talks about Ben Reck's uh, paper um, from uh, 2018 on using like Keith Wolfowitz. Okay, so, um, how come I don't have his name? It'll come, it'll come, it'll come. So Poisson's equation. So remember, I told you all, this is an incurable disease. Um, I caught this in 1990 and it will take me to my grave. Everywhere I go, it's there. So um, I've got a loss function, which is average cost. And, and there's my cost function there. And what you can do is you can solve Poisson's, Poisson's equation and then take the derivative of both sides. Um, and um, when you take the gradient of both sides, when I write gradient, I mean the gradient with respect to theta, um, you're gonna get an expression for it uh, in terms of expectations like this. And that is due to Schweitzer. And it was actually, this paper from uh, from 1968, it's actually his PhD thesis.
So it's a summary of his PhD thesis from MIT, which is a little bit earlier. And so he might not have written it this way, but this is what he did. You know, so he took gradients of both sides. And then if you take expectations after taking the gradient, you get two common terms and you cancel them out because <laughs> you do get steady state expectations. All right. And I could do the details, slide change. You know, if you take gradients of both sides, um, then you, you get a, a gradient of C, no problem there. Um, and then the tricky part, nothing tricky here yet. Then this, this is the product rule. <laughs> You know, right there. I've got a, a product of two things that depend on theta. That depends on theta. That depends on theta. So I've got to use the product rule. So I've got a gradient of P with respect to theta there and a gradient of H with respect to theta there. That's why it's just the product rule. And this is clear. All right. And then the trick is then to go through and fool around. And this is just a definition, right? Isn't it a definition? You know, good. The, gradient, yeah. the gradient, the log is just the gradient of P divided by P. So I've just multiplied and divided by P. Yeah. So that looks familiar, right? So, so the ingenuity that came about from actor critic methods is unbelievable. I mean, you know, I please know that I'm not dismissing anything, but the origin of perturbation theory of Markov chains is in this paper by Schweitzer. Um, and that that whole thing about score functions, you know, is um, is 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 found in his paper. Um, and then insane ingenuity came later. Um, yeah. All right. Okay. Um, so in terms of uh, active critic methods, so this is a good view for. I mean, Chaba, almost I, you did this already. So I'll go through it quickly. I mean, you did this on Monday. <laughs> it's just it's different language now. Um, but so you follow these design principles. I would like to do gradient descent. And so I don't have it. So I do stochastic approximation, you know, because I have a formula for the gradient. It's un, it, this is completely unbiased. Move the slide, close your eyes. Um, and then, you know, and then this beautiful fact is that you can go through and and uh, and replace this awful looking mess by the Q function times this square function, you know, and it's just a, bit, a little bit of algebra. It's nothing. It's just from the definition of C theta, you know, it's because what is C theta? I mean, C theta of X is a summation over U of C of X U times, you know, in my notation, the probability of choosing U given x, you know, so that, that's how you, how you get that. And the same with p theta, and p theta is similar. Right. So, you know, this, it just uh, is insanely beautiful. Um, and then, so then you get a new essay algorithm. Move the slide. Um, where now I can put in my q function times the square function um, and go. But of course, just like QAnon, where is Q? You know, who is Q? <laughs> you know, I should not make that joke, I know. But um, so then this insanely beautiful result, um, just absolutely insanely beautiful result from the Condens and Sickler's paper that, um, that we only need this result to be true. You know, we, I mean, Let's see, do I have it here? No. This is, you know, uh, TD1, as I described it, saves the day. You know, you choose compat what's called, what they call compatible features for your Q function approximation. And TD1, because it's minimizing that, uh, that bell and error in the right norm, you get this identity. It's just, uh, Absolutely beautiful. So it's one of the most beautiful results in mathematical RL for me. Again, I, it's a lot I don't know. So uh, Chaba, you know, I mean, I know there's a lot I don't know. 
Okay, so there's history. All right. Okay, questions? Ridicule? No. Okay, so let's talk about how you'd apply these ideas um, to a policy grading RL. Um, so uh, this was done for you, Achaba. Do you recognize that number? Recognize what? Oh, yeah, the this number. Yeah. yeah, do you recognize it? Mont Tempo? Oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's the tallest mountain in Alberta, so yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, so the mountain car, we've already seen the mountain car problem. You know, we, we have Rich Sutton who wants to drive to the top is the highest peak in Alberta. I don't know if that's possible, <laughs> but he doesn't have a lot of power. So he stalls and what he does is he puts it in reverse, goes full speed, shoots back, and then goes full speed forward and back and forward and eventually makes it to the top. You know, and and you don't want to keep going reverse forever because you'll shoot over this hill and end up in British Columbia. Yeah. All, right. All right. So here's a particular policy which I'll explain in a moment. But um, so what I, what I'm showing here sideways is the example, the famous example of Sutton, as it's normally shown. So this is nice curve here, and the the range of um, of uh, latitude is, is limited. Um, and what, what I've got is two different policies, which I'll explain in a moment, and three different initial conditions. So here, I'm starting at the top of the hill, and I, I actually, if I start off at full speed, you know, full throttle, I end up at the top. So that's why I just shoot to the top, I'm done. You know, I'm starting here with maximum speed, wham, I get there, done. In this one, I'm starting in the valley, so I'm starting here, and so I, I go forward and then stall, go backwards, go forward, and then I reach the top. You know? And here's a bit better, actually. Here I'm actually starting, not better, it seems better. I'm starting very close to the goal, but I'm stopped, so I have to roll back down. And I end up, look, what, look how bad the policy is. It goes all the way back to the peak here and is stuck for like 50 seconds, I mean like 20 seconds, their time steps before, it's because it, it's because there's, um, it's because of the, of the model, it takes a while for, go, for speed to go from negative to positive. You know? So this is another one with a different parameter where it takes a lot more oscillations from the valley to get to the top, but it doesn't spend so much time stuck on the, on the wrong peak. You know? So I haven't defined the policies yet, I will in a second. All right. But this is a parameterized family of policies, which I'll explain, and we'd like to find the best policy within that class. Is the setup clear? Okay, so I'll have to explain what this means. Um, okay, so the goal is the minimum time to travel to destination J. I'm just the destination, and that's my value function j of x. You know, which is, I should write it down. So the cost function is just one, and, uh, you know, well, no, let's make it infinity. Why not? You know, it's equal equal to one until I reach the destination and then it's zero. All right. Um, and then um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to say protect myself a little bit. So I'm going to look at the average uh, cost. Um, so basically, where I choose initial conditions. You know, so I, I'm basically going to randomly select. I'm not allowed to use the word random. <laughs> I'm going to select a whole bunch of initial conditions, maybe quasi randomly, and in order to avoid infinite numbers, I'm going to minimize with a, some value j max, because I, otherwise I don't know, I, I might have a policy for which this is infinity and it'll mess up my algorithm. So that's the loss function I'd like to minimize and let's do it by gradient descent. Okay. Um, so this is like an average cost. Oh yeah, here, here I actually say it. 
It could be an average cost, by the way, and the algorithm would be fine that, that I'm proposing. Whether it's, it's a stochastic model or a deterministic model, the algorithm is the same. It doesn't make any difference. The theory would change a bit. And then I've got this, uh, this procedure, right? I, I, I would like to do gradient descent. That's my goal, right? And I can't do that exactly in a model-free manner, so I have an approximation. You know? So these are not exactly equal. So this is an example where f bar is not exactly equal to f. I mean, I mean to the thing I want. And then there's a translation. So how would you do it? So there's a short lecture. Um, I just want us to think about it. So the sort of model you would look at, you know, you would identify if you actually played around with the simulator long enough, or if you looked at Rick Sutton's book, is that if you take the state to be position and velocity in discrete time, um, then the new position is the old position. The new position is the old position plus this discrete time velocity. Okay, and this plus a disturbance. You know, the disturbance is because you're going uphill or downhill or whatever. So there's a state-dependent disturbance here. I just don't want to have to specify it. You know. Um, and then there's a stickiness I mentioned here, that there's some value gamma, which is like 10 to the minus three in Sutton's book, I don't remember, um, times my input u, and the input u takes on value zero, one. Okay. Oh, zero, one, minus one, and one. Shut the mistake in my slides. <laughs> it's minus one, and one. So I'm either trying to go have the throttle on full forward or full backwards. Um, but you see the problem, the model has a sticky V, and so that's why you get stuck in one boundary for a long time. Uh, if, uh, anyway. So the disturbance captures everything, Shaba. It captures the landscape, it captures the fact there's a, there's a projection going on, everything. Okay, um, and again, typo. Um, so here's the policy I'm talking about. I have a parameterized po uh, family of policies for which um, I have a parameter of theta. And what I do is I, I, I construct a prediction. Let me, let me uh, write this down. I didn't have to do this. I was just messing around. I construct a prediction of my next state value. Why not? You know, we have a prediction. Let's use it. We didn't have to. Um, and if it's less than a parameter theta, it means I'm far from my goal. And what the hell, I'm gonna hit the gas and head towards my goal any way I can. Um, this is not informed by what the optimal policy looks like. It's not like this at all. The optimal policy has different structure. Um, well, if I'm not panicking, I go with the flow. Whatever direction I'm going, I push to go even faster in that direction. All right. So this is just from some, just, just it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something to play with, okay? And um, I was hoping to give a two-dimensional example, but blame it on NIPS <laughs> or NURPS. Okay, so we wanna find the best theta. So how would we use this QSA theory to accomplish that goal? Well, you've gotta use batch methods. It's the only way that I know of, okay? So if somebody else has a different idea, tell me. But the, to me, the clearest way to apply this is using batch techniques. Um, okay. All right. So, so that's that's what this is, right? So this is actually the performance of this policy, the way it's behaving um, for these two different guys. So you see here, I have one example where theta equals minus 0 0.8, which is way down over here. And I have another one with uh, theta equals uh, minus 0 0.2, which is over here. So this one is panicking all the time. I mean, every time it's over here, it's giving up and just hitting the, the gas. Um, well, this one doesn't panic very much at all. It's only when it's it's quite cl close to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, left side, closer to British Columbia. <laughs> okay. Um, it turns out this is the optimal done by brute force calculation. 
um, for the setup that I looked at. Okay, even though it's in this example, it's worse. You know, um, there's one for these three initial conditions. This policy does this better than this policy for one initial condition. Okay, so let's look at let's play around with this and let's think about what how we would implement these two algorithms. And I, I, I can't remember. Yeah. Oh, good, good, good. And so maybe I should stop. Somebody tell me what they would do. What's L? Well, whether you got to the top or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we we sort of went yeah. down, haven't we? Yeah. Um, let's just make sure it's in front of us. So this is L, but we're not going to take an infinite limit. So we need a noisy um, uh, surrogate for L. Oh, can I make you guys sick? I'm sorry. So there's L to answer your question. But we need a surrogate. You know, we need a, we need, we, what we need is, you know, a, something observable and with limited data. <laughs> um, and I guess it's right there. We'll just use it. So we can't use this at all. So this is this is the original definition. By the way, yeah, yeah. I hate to say, but you have a typo here as well. X not. Oh yeah. We go to X N, not X K. Oh, let me see. Oh, scheiße. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so these are these are supposed to be sampled uh, initial conditions. Um, so we could we could get rid of the n and define that to be l. Uh, but why not just take that? So let's let's that, that this is the thing. I should put an l bar there now. Let's redefine the thing, and let's just call that you know l. It's sort of like l of theta noise. And you see, I'm going to get into trouble because I can't, I can't exactly apply this algorithm. So I chose this example in part. So if I first initial condition to be pristine, it would just be exactly um, QSA as I defined it. Um, but um, um, but I, I don't want to. I want to be able to look at the average uh, cost, you know, over a big range of initial conditions. Right. So we need a slight extension. Close your eyes, everybody. Um, so the slight extension is this. What we do is we, for each n, we perform an experiment. We, uh, for each n, we choose an initial condition. You know, and we choose a a uh, a parameter. So so uh, basically an experiment at time n. So it's not really a batch, but it's not it's not like this microscopic following the process. I just take an initial condition, you know, which I decide I choose here. I choose a parameter fixed, fixed, and I I I I I observe this value function from a run, uh, you know, with this parameter and with this initial condition, you know, and that's what I plug into this uh, to this guy, and um, and and yes, Java, this is a great example. You'll be in big trouble if it's not. If it's if the model is, is stochastic, because <laughs> if the model is stochastic, these are different L's, so it requires a deterministic reality. I mean, so method one. I'm so glad you brought that up, 
Method one requires that the repeat experiments are the same. It requires a deterministic uh, world. But not two, not one A. Because, because, because of the fact that I put in this, oh, yeah, um, I mean, here, I, I identify my L with this parameter and then this parameter. For these guys, everything to cancel out nicely, the L's have to be the same, you know. Um, yeah. So, so anyway. So in the experiments, it was a, a deterministic world. But let's first look at the, so this one doesn't. So this, this, this is perfectly valid in the stochastic world. Now, there's a Lipschitz issue, but I, this is the one that I tried out. And it was magic, like I said. Um, it's, uh, as I said before, typical trajectories don't seem to take, a, they take a long time to converge to the exact value, but they get in, you know, basically where it's minimized very, very quickly. I mean, just like that. And if you, instead of um, sine waves, if you put an IAD uniform, it just doesn't, it takes forever. It's almost worthless. But, so that's one way you can apply these things is is in, in this case, it's sort of a batch. I mean, in this case, it's so natural to use a batch method. You, you do a run, you do a run because it's an ultimate goal. But in general, I would try a batch method as well, maybe, you know, just look at, or in five horizon problems, it's completely natural. Okay, so, um, so that's that. I don't know when we started, uh, but I wanted this to be a bit lighter. Um, oh yeah, yeah, but comparison of the two QSA algorithms. So this is the one that's not Lipschitz, and this is the one that is. I found I had to double the gain, um, which I don't really understand why. Considering these two guys have almost identical ODEs, um, I was surprised that the behavior was as different as it was. Um, but I guess it has to do with the fact that my theory depends on the Lipschitz con continuity. Um, but uh, but here, it um, it's just it, it gives it gives you the same answer every time. Um, every these, you know I'm doing a thousand independent runs from different initial conditions for theta, and uh, and this is way more reliable when you can use it. Okay. Um, so in conclusion, I presented a beautiful, hopefully marriage of probability theory control and reinforcement learning. And it's funny for me to emphasize that, considering the entire last two hours have been trying to eliminate this and replace it with sine waves. Um, but, uh, but anyway, that's, that's the message. I still think that probability theory is insanely valuable and every step of analysis was inspired by the probabilistic analysis for stochastic approximation. Um, and every bit of the theory that you could find in those lecture notes either adapts or steals theory outright from stochastic approximation. And it's easy because this is covariance matrix, which is zero. That's what makes things so simple compared to the analysis in, in the stochastic case. It's, you'll see it's way, way easier. Close your eyes. Um, you know, this is, you know, is it really so useful in, in finance? <laughs> I don't know. So the very first paper I've seen on this was from a finance professor in France, but the volatility uncertainty, it dominates everything. I don't think my little sine waves are gonna help that. Um, high dimension, I mean, Jesus, you know, we've got all these friends machine learning They'll do batch coordinate, batch algorithms. I, I bet you know we, you know, our friends will help us. <laughs> um, I definitely am not promoting a million-dimensional vector of sine waves, <laughs> which is what you'd need. No, 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 no. Um, and I think it'd be fun to combine all this stuff with other modes of acceleration. Again, again, the friends here, meaning the ML community. Um, so there's lots of collaboration there that I think would be cool. Um, and um, yeah, and then, 
And then I'd love to apply this to some cool applications. The best, most obvious application on earth is wind farms. There's no way you have a model. There's no way you can take a gradient. You can just collect the energy that's being delivered by this wind farm and then adjust the pitch of the and the orientation of the turbines and try to make them oscillate and excite them in order to optimize. It would be a, it would be a blast. So I, I'm begging you, NRL. Um, so yeah, that, that's all. So that's all for me. Yay. <laughs> I'm sorry you can't join me. It's, uh... Oh, yeah, that's a pity. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'll wait till after Andre's lecture. Yeah, I have to say that. Save that for after the lecture. Uh, yeah. People are uploading on chat as well. Yeah, yeah I wanted to uh, ask you, like reinforcement learning is, is just a complicated optimization met optimization problem from, from this perspective, right? Um, but yeah, well, this last one. Um, right. Um, it's and, only this last one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, I'm not, this is not how to find RL. It's just one approach. So. Sure, um, sure. Um, yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, sir. I, I didn't mean that. Uh, yeah, I just make sure everybody knows that there's one approach. Um. Yeah, um, mainly I'm just reflecting on that. Uh, if you want to understand this uh, quasi uh, stochastic, uh, quasi Monte Carlo approach, would be more natural to, you know, just start with, I guess the previous part of the lecture was like that, that you just yeah. want to solve a pure optimization problem or a pure online learning problem and, and try to understand what the advantages uh, of the quasi Monte Carlo approach could be there. Yeah, Even it's really hard, isn't it? Yeah. What's that? If if you can only make a, like in online learning, uh, you know, like you have a sequence of loss functions, you're trying to minimize regret, let's say, uh, yeah. and the losses are convex, maybe they leave on something simple as zero one interval, uh, but you can only make one measurement. Yeah. Uh, then one approach yeah. is to randomize. Uh, yeah. But maybe randomization, uh, you made me think that, uh, Maybe it's not so essential. So we, we tend to think that, okay, you should randomize to gain a little bit more information about, you know, the function. Randomization and, and uh, yeah, makes uh, a lot of things, estimating quantities of interest uh, much easier. Yeah. Um, but is, like, have you thought about whether with this, uh, one point measurements uh, in the online setting, uh, the quasi random approach would also be uh, a viable approach. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, this, the thing is that I can, I can give you results for this if you allow me to project. You know, the whole problem is stability. The, you know, I, I don't think this is stable. So um, you can project a bonded interval. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the theory for this, the theory for this is crisp. If you allow me to project onto a compact set, right. um, or, or or mess with it, you know, just sort of, you know, uh, L starts out quite, I mean, strongly convex, say, and then make it look more linear for large theta, and then everything's okay. Um, so you need to know, have a prior on where theta is, you know, and then you can, then you can run this thing for sure, and the theory will will go through. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and and then you'll get the one you'll you'll get this faster rate of convergence if you design the algorithm properly. Um, hmm. Yeah. Um, and now I suddenly don't like one of n anymore. <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah. um. mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah, but it's, I mean, but I did project. <laughs> mm -hmm. When I finally ran this experiment, I did project. And you can see here, I mean, look how crazy Kiva Wolf, I mean, uh, not Kiva Wolf, it's the stochastic dynamics are compared to the, I mean, look at this. It's, every, every trajectory wants to go to a different value. Um, but maybe it's a step this tuning question there. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I did, but I did mess around. I really tried. Okay. I, I really was being fair here. I used constant step size. I used one over square root of n. I used, I mean, one of the end of, I mean, one of the end of the three halves, things like that. Um, I, I did not, I promise you, I didn't take, I did not just show you the worst example. I really didn't. Okay. Um, hmm, worst examples. The worst examples were point masses at the boundaries of where I projected. <laughs> um, so someone asking, I'm not sure if I understood the one A algorithm was for the case of stochastic and yet you don't think it is stable. Oh no, it's not stable. So this algorithm here, unless mm -hmm. you project theta, it's not stable. Um, and um, I mean, here the domain of theta is naturally bounded, so it doesn't it doesn't really apply. So, um, so, but um, um, I guess what, yeah, whoever I mean, has yeah. a question is uh, yeah. meaning that uh, this is Kiefer Wolfowitz. Uh, well, it's not really. Uh, I got to uh, shake my head uh, first. In the, in the in the lecture notes, I accidentally write KW here. Just a sloppy error because this is Kiefer Wolfowitz with IED noise. Um, so this, I'm calling it, I didn't have a name for it. So it's just the second algorithm, 1A. Is this a single meaning, point SPSA or, yeah. Uh, say it again? Is there a name for this? The single point SPSA, um, uh -huh. like one point measurement, SPSA, simultaneous perturbation, stochastic approximation, by okay. Spall. Um, well, well, yeah, oh, Spall, yeah, Spall 2000 or something, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he's the first. He's the first restaurant reference in the control side that made reference to Kiefer Wolfowitz that I could find. I should have referenced him actually. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, but um, but you know, hold so a second. I I, I kind of misspoke, everybody. We do have convergence um, results for these. Uh, if you're controlling with, with, with projection, yeah, there's no way I can prove it. Yes, projection, yes. Yeah. Um, but here, like what, what we see on these trajectories is nothing like convergence. Well, here, here's You're the thing, everybody. I, I can tell you what the problem is. So, um, where's, so, so notice that this blue curve here, sorry, it's hard to read. Um, this blue curve here is my objective function, you know? Sure. That's that's um, J of theta. Okay. Um, yeah, or L of theta, whatever. By by real L of theta. Um, and you notice it's quite steep and then quite shallow. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in order to get good behavior because of that steepness, I need a small gain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and 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 so if I and what happens is if I don't take my this to be small enough. I get insane chattering. It just goes wham, 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 wham. <laughs> mm -hmm. just, you get mm -hmm. you get this 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 behavior here persists for the entire run, mm -hmm. and it's because of the steepness and then flat. You know, it's it's it's, it's numerically it badly behaves because of that. Um, and so this thing ends up you know avoiding the steep regions, and so it doesn't get blasted out. Every time you hear, you just get this chattering that's crazy. That's mm -hmm. how you get these big outliers. Um, yeah, and even even I guess that's steep. You know, it just it just bounces around. Um, but so I had to make in order to not have a thing something that's just chattering for the whole run, I reduced the gain on both, so they both have the same uh, step size, so that I got something at least reasonable on the right side. Um, it, it'll converge. You let it run long enough, it'll converge. Uh, but this is but this is you know, I can prove one over n, and this is one over, well, not one over n, log log n <laughs> over n, yeah. Um, if you, at best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, actually, I didn't use a one over n step size. I used one over n to the nine tenths or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'll, I'll put that in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we do have another question and just a quick clarification question. By projecting projection, do you mean projection onto a smaller space? What what do you yeah, mean? I by oh I just mean that uh, that I said I then after both of these I I I I, I um how do I say this? Just this. If you have an interval or something. Yeah, so here I have an interval, so I can just, I can just do that. Do it. Coordinate yeah. and, I and, then... and, I, and I had to do it uh, in this example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it, just, it just didn't work. Um, yeah. Um, you know, just, um, yeah. Oh, I have to because of the thing. I'm sorry. But I, I had to, I mean, oh, what am I trying to say? Um, Oh, I'm still, I got myself confused. That's something else. No, no, no. Here was instability, but I had to because of the physics. Yeah. Okay. I, I do have a very high level question. Yeah. I guess maybe it's, it's just way too high level. So I'm trying to think about. Uh, Okay, it's, this talk is supposed to be, you know, like control perspective brought into RL. Yeah. And you were talking about some aspects of control theory yeah, that yeah. are impacting RL and have been impacting RL, yeah. uh, like stochastic approximations, obviously, uh, like some history of like this extreme seeking. Uh, yeah. But most of control theory is not like this. No, 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 no. So ninety percent of control theory is about you know linear systems and transfer functions, mm -hmm. um, and then and then just like in every field, there are cults. You know, so there are people working consensus or mean field games. You know, which is a great thing about academia. I think that this people form a, a little clan. And they feed off each other and come up with ideas. Um, and I, I, I chose these topics both because they're exciting to me and because I thought I thought they um, reflected things that were relevant. Um, like I mentioned, controlled Lyapunov functions, or as a whole another cult or, or or tribe. Tribe is the word within control, for which there are all sorts of ideas that could be useful. So I mentioned that in the first lecture. Uh, but, but it's just too hard to get into it. Um, and they would use these same techniques. They would use like gradient descent techniques like we talked about. Um, yeah, so I guess my uh, very high level question would be, uh, can you think off the top of your head about other areas, ideas that are overlooked by people working on RL that we should bring in, we should Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we should need entropy. Yeah. Uh, who else? I've mentioned two, you know, ML is a no brainer. We have to seduce them into this. And, um, and also some numerical analyst uh, types. Mm. Um, and, yeah, yeah, and the, the quasi Monte Carlo crowd, but no, I can't think. Right? I mean, it's too. You're right. It's too hard. I can't think of an answer right now. It'll come to me. I'll, I'll have to sleep on it. But it's a good question. Yeah, what other, this what other tribes? And if you, yeah, I think yeah. Um, it's an open-ended question. Rene uh, is asking: Is it possible to use Pontryagin principle in RL, like it is done in stochastic control? Can we recover some of leaning this way? Well, oh God, thanks for that question. So, <laughs> oh man, oh, that's awesome. Um, so, oh wow. So, um, 
we need to do it. So, so uh, um, it's like uh, I haven't seen a paper where it's done. You see, oh yeah, well, let me let me step back for a second. I'll answer the question. But so, I'll, from from practitioner's point of view, like. 99% of what's done in practice, like in all sorts of things, chemical engineering, process control, I don't know, all sorts of, people get paid a lot of money, they're not exciting applications. They use what's called MPC, you know, receding horizon control. They solve a fine horizon optical control problem, you know, and they throw away everything but the first action and they repeat the optimization problem. And, um, um, and the solution to that, to those, uh, fine horizon optimal control problems are based on the HJB equations if it's continuous time. And, um, um, and you know, we can do what we've been doing now and take time as a variable and just use, LQ, use Q learning or whatever. Um, but, but yes, I, I'm with, so Prashant and I have been talking about this for 10 years and, and uh, he'll, hate, he'll kill me for saying this, but of trying to sort of reinvent RL by really looking more carefully at the minimum principle, you know, which is about just directly solving the state and co-state equations and, and coming up with algorithms based on that. And I'm sorry, Prashant, yeah, <laughs> but that's something. So Prashant, you, it's been 10 years. <laughs> well, we've been wanting Maybe to, this is the time to do it. Yeah, this is a good time to do it. So Renee, if you want to collaborate on that, you know, please, I, I, I would love to, uh, just sort of come up with a whole new framework based on all the beautiful concepts of the you know, minimum principle. It's an amazing machine. Because, you know, so Grit Sutton picked up the, the uh, similarity between the Q function and the Hamiltonian, and we expanded it on it in that 2009 paper. But, but that's a, that's not it, that's not the minimum principle. <laughs> uh, I could say more if you want me to. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. A, the Q function is a compression of the minimum principle. Um, you know, the minimum principle is a two-point boundary value problem. You know, you you want I want to minimize you know integral zero to t of c of x t u t d t. You know, and I end up with a Lagrangian in a way. You know, an x dot equals f of x. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I've got this Lagrangian, um, God, I'm going to get scared here. So there's, um, so. Um, that is X L. and U and, yeah. Yeah, I'm getting myself scared. So there's the dynamics. Um, I've got, uh, no, oh, hold on, I've got, I've got the notation. But you end, up, you end up with a state, you have the state dynamics, you have a co-state. Um, which mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to, I guess I can't write down right now um, because this is considered a constraint. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it turns out that there's something, oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Well, let's see. It's the, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm just a little bit flustered because PF plus L. Damn, damn, damn me. Everybody just wait a second, okay? Please. Mm -hmm. So it's just um, P transpose F um, plus C. Well, of course, um, F and C are functions in X and U. So it's really, you know, I'll write it out. Mm -hmm. No, that's fine. I see we got it. Yeah, I've got it. I just, I just realized that some people don't know what I'm talking about. What's a variable? What's it? What's not? Okay. Okay. So, we, so we know that x dot is equal to the gradient of h uh, at x p u. Everybody can see that, right? Because <laughs> it's linear in p, mm -hmm. and we know that x dot equals f. And then is it the negative? And that's that's um. Partial p, gradient p, and p dot equals minus gradient x. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the minimum principle, 
And there's an amazing fact that uh, P turns out to be, um, it, when you find it, it's like a P star of T, it's equal to the gradient of the value function evaluated at X T star. Which also depends on T if it's finite horizon, all right? So, mm -hmm. um, um, so, um, so in the continuous time, it's not so clear, but when you, after this plugin is when you see the Q function connection, you know, this leads to a connection to the Q function. Sure. That's not what I'm talking about, not what Renee's talking about, I don't think. This whole beautiful theory should be a, a beautiful oyster to crack and create new R algor algor algorithms. It would be really practical. Um, By the way, is there, figure this out. is there an um, equivalent of this for the stochastic case? Hmm. Stochastic case. Yeah. Um, I know, guess if you're I messy, mean, you can probably. There is. It's, it is messy. It's true. Um, you know, people are still writing papers on this, on stochastic minimum principle and stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's not as it's not as elegant, but but the thing is, oh my! I wish I had time. If you if you look at the I maybe mean, it's not there. So many problems, even if they're stochastic, you can pretend they're deterministic and get a really good solution. It really is true. I, if we had time, I'd I'd explain why that's true. It's very often you can bound the error. So what is it? Um, oh, okay. You know, you just run an algorithm pretending it's deterministic, okay. and this, you can you can see what it converged to, and it's really pretty close to what you cared about. And I can yeah. give you a formula for the gap in um, in say discounted cost optimal control. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. if there's huge volatility, you're screwed. <laughs> okay, it's only you know, but if but in normal problems, it's yeah. Some regularity must must be yeah, there because yeah. uh, I can yeah, easily yeah. come up with problems yeah. where it's absolutely not true. Yep, absolutely. Um, you need, you need, and I have to go back. But it's amazing how robust it is. It's all about volatility, not about smoothness. Yeah, I, I think it is. In, yeah, it would be interesting yeah. to see this. Uh, I, I've got, I've got it written up. I think it might be this lecture notes. Um, um, oh no, it's in, it's in that paper. So if you look in Discord, somebody dug up that, um, that uh, my lecture two is based on an archive paper. Um, there's a whole section devoted to when can we ignore volatility. Okay. Um, yeah. And it's 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 um it's simple, but it's just uh you know it's a kind of justification that control people have in mind all the time when they they do design pretending that the world is deterministic when they know it's not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think our time so yeah, is yeah, it I'm sure. is Wait, like what? What was the so the next talk is four thirty? We must be we must be out of over time. No, that's that's. I mean, it's okay. I just don't want to buy it into the time of the next talk. But I think we are fine uh, because the next is going to start at four thirty. That's fine. So we do have a bunch of questions in the Q and A. Okay, cool, cool. Um, so uh, Ahmad's asking in outline of feedback system scenario book. Uh, you, Sean, mentioned fluid models and cues in chapter eight. Can you oh. quickly explain the connection between our hell and these concepts? Oh, wait, wait, which one? The, the fluid chapter models? Chapter eight of your new feedback systems in our app. Oh, 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 yeah, Someone. yeah. So, oh, that's so funny. So, really um, so if, if, so Sean's tutorial. in 2010 <laughs> would have been <laughs> you know you say q theta of xu equals i'll write it out longhand this <laughs> What is it? How? Uh, how to choose? How, how to choose the features? Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Because because I, I'm sorry, I'm slow. I didn't believe in neural networks. I had no idea 
you know, or, or, or how about 2009? Because by 2010, I think I knew. No, no, I didn't. No, no, I'm not going to pretend I was. I was ignorant in 2010 as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I had no idea what would happen with neural networks. I just, I was in, I was in a cave. Um, and but the thing is that there's so many methods for, for model reduction, and why not put them to use in an architecture for Q learning or TV learning? Um, so if you look at my book on, on networks, the final chapter is about that. Um, and so it's really about that. It's basically architectures. Um, that's one way you can use model knowledge in order to get an architecture, is that you know the value function is convex, and piecewise convex, piecewise quadratic, blah, blah, blah. And you, you dump, dump that into your architecture. And for QE networks in particular, there are mean field models, or there are OD models of QE networks where there's so much structure for the value function, it's insane. And so it's crazy not to use that structure. You know, the value function is smooth, it's piecewise quadratic, all sorts of structure. Um, so that's what that that's what that section, the chapter of the book is about. And I, I have a book chapter I wrote. Yeah, in fact, see book chapter 2010. <laughs> The whole book chapter on that topic. Yeah. Okay, so what's the title of that tutorial? Just show the selection. It's, it's feature selection <laughs> for neural dynamic programming. That was supposed to be a joke. I always liked that title, even though it didn't catch on. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was cute. And I also, it was, you know, I just feel like, um, well, never mind. My first love in RL was the stuff coming out of MIT, you know, John Fasiklis and Ben Van Roy and Conda. I just, I, you know, that, that was my starting point, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, For many of us. Uh, so uh, Russian has another high level question. RL encompasses the trajectory planning part of control rather than just stabilization. Mm -hmm. Do you think control theory has useful ideas to approach this problem, um, <laughs> well, that would be my first talk. Right? In RL, there seems to be a lot of interest in exploration to solve this. Why? Well, which thing? So, what's this? I guess, like the trajectory planning part of like the high level planning, like conceptualizing yeah. like, the whole thing yeah. together. Like you have the right, task yeah. objective, and yeah, like how yeah, yeah. to break it down and yeah, that, that's why you think about like in ride sharing, sort of, I mean, sort of macro problems where there's so much complexity and all that, and exploration is so huge, you know. Um, absolutely, that's a big part. And you see, that's what I have not talked about, you know, and it's not because I don't think it's important, it's just too hard to fit in. Um, but I guess control, control, control people, yeah, yeah. yeah, control people. Uh, when they approach a problem like this, what's the thinking? What's the, what are the tools that they're thinking about? Oh, for the trajectory it's planning easier. problem? It's, yeah. it's basically, yeah, I mean, it's all model-based. So they have forecasts of traffic. You know, say the problem of driving across the city, they have they assume forecasts of traffic with some bounds on the, on the uncertainty in those forecasts, um, you know, and they and they they will build up a state model with those features, you know, in their optimal control problem. Um, um, and um, and so there's no the only time you'll see exploration is when people do adaptive control, and then you get the same issues: persistence of excitation, insufficient exploration, um, mm -hmm. and all that. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. The adaptive control community dropped the ball on the trajectory planning problem because that would have been where they could have made the most impact. Is sort of that higher level thinking. I think they made they made a few mistakes. That's that's another one. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it wasn't as well understood. It was sort of glossed over in education. You know, it's a it's that usual gap of the people doing the theory and the people putting to practice. There's a wall in most communities between the two. Um, mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. 
that would explain it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so Omid uh, uh asking a question. Uh, he says, "I like your paper on minimum principle interpretation of Q learning. Other works that find the relationship between HGB equation with actor critic." Oh, cool. Huh. Not that I know of. No, wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, duality's right there, so it must be it must be sitting there. Maybe somebody else in the audience knows. We'll see. Uh, in, in the meanwhile, yeah, like maybe maybe someone's going to write something. Yeah. Um, I, I don't uh, know much about this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. there is there is a comment here addressed to me. I don't know. Related to my high-level question and something in control that might be overlooked in our app. Personally, I think robust control might be one of such things. I see. Yeah. There were beautiful theories about designing robust controls that can tolerate disturbance, adversarial noises, which may be useful for developing robust, safe algorithms nowadays. In some, it seems that the current relation between RL and control is more an adaptive control and optimal control. Two important topics in control, but less on robust control and at the corner store right. in control. Although we should mention yeah. that Vex, uh, group has been really active, like others too, on bringing ideas from robust control to RL. Um, it's not completely overlooked, but uh, also in RL, uh, just off the top of my head, robust MDPs is a separate thing. Um, mm. Yeah. So do you? Do you agree with this, Sean, that uh, well, maybe... Yeah, well, well, in terms of people that should be brought in, they're already in. The people doing game theory are already writing to RL, like Tim Ebershaw was one. Um, mm. And so robust the control, yeah, the, 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 the nonlinear part of robust control is all sort of game theory, where you have disturbances that are adversaries, and you're trying to control for the worst uh, adversary. Um, and Tamir Bashar has a million books on this. is a big, a big discipline, and, th and th so there could be ideas there in the, the game theory and robust control literature would be useful. Um, but to, for me, the most elegant parts of robust control were all for linear systems. Just uh, quite amazing theory there. Um, mm -hmm. So Omid was just uh, noting about the previous comment that, OK, there is this PD OD correspondence going on. So that's why he thinks, I think, that HGB and Q learning duality mm. somehow will happen. Sure, in a way, yeah. Yeah. All um, right, I think that we should let people uh, take a break. Uh, <laughs> it's a wonder that so many stayed. Um, so thanks everyone. Uh, thanks, Sean. Uh, big, big thanks. Uh, oh yeah, I think yeah. It, what, a, it, what, a, what a pleasure, man. Yeah. It was wonderful. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. Learned much. Uh, and looking forward to the next talk by Andre. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We should drink the thing uh, once yeah, again. That's right. Get I okay. still have to wait, don't I? Yeah. Okay. Well, you don't have to <laughs> that bottle, but yeah, wow. Well, okay. yeah, yeah. it's, it's, it's a good prop. It's a good prop, yeah. <laughs>